<clears throat> Please open your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. Daniel, chapter 3. And while you're turning to that location, I will begin a rather lengthy introduction by suggesting that over the last 20 years, a very noticeable sociological change has occurred in our culture, which is made manifest in many ways, but the way that's been the most noticeable to me as a person who deals a lot in words is that we, it's what we say to one another as we part from one another. In my lifetime of just over 50 years, there's been a very clear evolution or devolution, depending upon your perspective, in our parting greeting. But before we get to that, let's do a quick survey of party greetings, parting greetings recorded in the Bible. Now, we could do that a few different ways. Maybe the easiest is to look at the end of the New Testament letters, which contain written parting greetings, beginning with the letter from Paul the Apostle to the Christians in Rome. Uh, how does the apostle part from the Roman church as far as his letter to them is concerned? The answer is found in Romans 16, 24, where Paul, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, writes, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Paul uses that same basic parting greeting in 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and Philippians. He parts from the Colossian Christians by saying something to one of them and then something to all of them. To one of them, he says, as recorded in Colossians 4.17, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. In other words, do what the Lord has called you to do. And then in the next verse, he says to them, he says to all of them, remember my chains and grace be with you. In 1 and 2 Thessalonians, he returns to the parting greeting of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 1 Timothy is written to an individual rather than a church. And Paul's parting greeting to Timothy is recorded in 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21, where he says, O oh, Timothy, Guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. In his second recorded letter to Timothy, Paul tells him to do his utmost to come to him before winter. And then he says, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit grace be with you. And that grace be with you parting greeting is used with Titus and Philemon as well. The writer to the Hebrews parts from them by urging them to do the work God has given them to do before saying grace be with you. The letter from James to God's people doesn't really contain a parting greeting. 1 Peter closes with peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. 2 Peter closes with the instruction to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 John ends with the admonishment to keep yourselves from idols. And 2 and, John, uh, two and 3 John basically ends with hope to see you soon, peace. Jude closes with a doxology, but no real parting greeting. So, to sum up, parting greetings in the New Testament are comprised mostly of, get this, get this clearly please, instruction to do what God says to do, and then a prayer for God's grace for the doing it. Okay, what about the parting words of Jesus to his disciples. They're recorded in the words we so often refer to as the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, where Jesus 
tells his guys to go do what they've been given to do. And Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's his closing greeting. Do what I've commanded you to do, and I'm with you as you do it. This is very similar to many closing readings in the Old Testament. I won't take the time to read those, but you can read them for yourself, and you'll find, I think, a fair summary of closing greetings in the Old Testament as something like, go do what God has given you to do, and don't be afraid, don't fear, be of good courage. And this finally brings me back to what has happened in our culture in the last 20 years. Our closing greeting in my lifetime has gone from goodbye to bye-bye to buh-bye to see you later to just later to just see ya to take care now and finally in, and in my view tragically where we are now which is the parting greeting I see so often now is be safe and that's not even enough. That has moved to stay safe. Stay safe. Oh, what a contrast from what we see in the Bible. Go into all the world. Do the work of God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. Be strong in God's grace. Be courageous. Grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. God's grace be with you and give you peace. Stay safe? Nothing in the Bible like that. Nothing. Those who pay very close attention to such sociological trends began to see this shift to be safe and then to stay safe in our culture right around September 12, 2001. One writer makes the following observations. Safety has become a cultural obsession to the point that many institutions and policymakers have adopted the ideal of a harm-free world as a realistic objective, a fantasy perhaps most strikingly expressed through intolerance toward risk and accidents. Thus, America's emergency medical establishment has been in the forefront of the movement to banish the word accident from their lexicon, replacing it with the term preventable injury. The idealization of safety and survival as values in their own right, as ends in and of themselves and not as means to an end, has acquired a commanding influence over public life. From this perspective, the writer continues, the exaltation of heroism and courage by previous generations became almost entirely incomprehensible, except perhaps within the confines of society's warrior classes, like the military, and far less so police work. Survivalism leads to a devaluation of heroism, as was the entire stock of allegedly outworn ideals of honor, heroic defiance of circumstances, <coughs> and self-transcendence. I'm still quoting. These traditional virtues have been displaced by the quest for safety one of the most unattractive features of the, what the writer calls the deification of safety is the apparent tendency to elevate its dictates above the value of freedom. Within the moral framework of the culture of fear, safety, and security are first order values while freedom is reduced to a second order value at best. This is why the argument that curbing the right to free speech on college campuses is supposedly a small price to pay to protect someone from the pain of being offended has gained traction in recent times, end quote. So who are the heroes in a stay safe culture? It's those who are good at games. 
those who are good at entertaining us while we watch. Because watching rather than doing is the best way, you see, to stay safe. Brothers and sisters, Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Christians are safe. The righteous, that is, those who are righteous in Christ Jesus, are safe. So Proverbs 28.1 says this about the righteous. It says, because they are safe, they are as bold as a lion. Can you imagine looking at the king of beasts about to go out and do what God designed him to do and saying, stay safe. This is not what I'm saying to my daughter as she prepares to go out on her own into the world. I'm not saying stay safe, but rather I'm saying go out there and do what God has called you to do, knowing whether you live a hundred years or die today in Christ Jesus, you are safe. Now go be bold for him. Take risks for him. Go in freedom, like the third part of our church mission statement says, go in freedom for Christ. Can you imagine God the Father sending his son from heaven to earth saying, stay safe. Jesus did not stay safe, nor did he or does he encourage others to, to stay safe. Jesus had courage. Jesus was free. Jesus was bold. Lloyd Ogilvy writes, an undeniable sign of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit is boldness. It's the inner delight of a liberated person expressed in daring. In the midst of human impotence and the timidity of institutionalized religion, the great need is for boldness. Boldness in loving. Boldness in forgiving. Boldness in speaking the truth in love and bold obedience to the strategy of God revealed to us. And part of that strategy, dear church, is not loving our lives to the death. Revelation 12, 11. Man, I hope we're not sending a generation out into the world with stay safe ringing in their ears. Look at your Bible now, Daniel chapter three, verse number one, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, that's about 90 feet, and its width, six cubits, that's about nine feet. He set it up in the plain of Dura. He set up this image, this idol of gold, 90 feet high, nine feet wide. He set it up in the province of Babylon. At least one scholar I read estimates the weight of this thing to be 4.4 million pounds. That's 4.4 million pounds of gold. An estimated price tag, if this exact same image were to be built at today's gold prices, it would cost maybe around $2.3 billion. All that to say, King Nebuchadnezzar is serious about this. He's heavily invested in this. Verse two. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together. Notice, notice who gathers. The satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, verse three says... They all gathered together for the dedication of the image that the king had set up. And it ends by saying, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Quick question, who is the they? Who is standing before this idol? Quick answer, everyone who's anyone in the kingdom. Everyone who's anyone in the kingdom is standing before this idol. Everyone who has any kind of notable, keyword, position, everyone who has any kind of notable position in the kingdom 
is standing before this idol. I mean, how long do you think they'd maintain their notable positions if they failed to show up? King Nebuchadnezzar has constructed a culture in which anyone who desires any kind of favorable position is going to have to fall in line. The exact same thing is going on right now in our culture. How long is someone going to have a favorable position in our culture who does not stand before the rainbow flag in this month of June? And that's just one of many examples. Christians, we are being and will increasingly be, number one, tested regarding our position. Our position at work, our position at school, our position in the community. And if we're going to stay safe, we're going to have to fall in line. Our position in Christ, our position before God is increasingly coming into conflict with our position in this world. So we'll be tested more and more regarding our position and number two, regarding our persecution. Beginning with verse four, please. Then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Notice the emphasis here on diversity. Verse four, peoples, nations, languages. Verse five, all these musical instruments from all over the world playing in symphony. This is little more than our culture, from its demands of idolatry to its obsession with diversity. And anyone who's not into the idolatry for the sake of the diversity gets cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Anyone who's not down with the world's program, you see, gets persecuted. And this will test us, Christians. Are we going to stay safe? We'll be tested regarding our position, our persecution, and number three, we'll be tested regarding our peers. Look at verse seven, please. So at that time, when all the people, unity, heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp, and lyre in symphony with all kinds of music, diversity, all the people, nations and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. This is astounding unity in diversity here. Our peers, the entire world is unified around the worship of this idol. This is practically before us in the text. This is practically a one world religion here. And this would be greatly celebrated. Everyone's in agreement. Everyone's getting along. And so there would be tremendous pressure to join right in. Tremendous pressure. Are we going to stay safe? If not, says our culture, then you're the problem. Christian, you are the problem in this culture. Again, this ancient Babylonian culture is our culture today through and through. If we insist on being different, we'll be accused of causing trouble, of creating dissension. It's good for everyone else after all. Why isn't it good enough for us? Why do we want to upset the unity of our peers? I'm telling you, the pressure to conform to this world is already pretty intense and it's going to get much more intense. One might, t one might say seven times hotter, more intense as time goes on. We'll be tested regarding our position, our persecution, and our peers. Dear church, we cannot stay safe. 
We must not only be different, but we must also be, by God's grace, determined. Determined, number one, in the face of insinuation. In the face of insinuation. Let's start reading at verse 8, please. Daniel 3, 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Verse 12, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, what's the main insinuation here? I'd suggest to you that it's there in verse 12. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you, to you. The Amplified Bible and the ESV and the NIV say, these men, O king, pay no attention to you. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says these men have ignored you, the king. That's the real charge, you see. The symptoms of that charge is that they don't serve your gods or worship the gold image that you have set up. But the real insinuation is a sliding of the king. They're they're, they're being accused of what amounts to a personal attack on him. Is that what it really is? Of course not. Will you do half the stuff of which this world is going to accuse you? Of course not. Will you have your intentions misinterpreted and misstated? Yes, you will. And what it will amount to, you'll be accused of sliding something or someone if you refuse to slight God. Hear that again, please. You'll be accused of sliding something or someone if you refuse to slight God unless you stay safe. If you refuse to slight God, then you'll be accused of sliding pretty much everyone else. And one thing that's absolutely not allowed in our Babylonian culture today is the sliding of anyone except God. But we must be determined in the face of insinuation and in the face of number two, Interrogation, interrogation. Verse 13, please. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, pause there for a moment and know this, brethren. In the Bible, king and kingdom are always united. So the king and the entire kingdom are in rage and fury over the men of God. Our world right now, church, is in rage and fury about us and will be increasingly in rage and fury about us if we don't stay safe. Nobody but nobody sets people off today more than a Christian who doesn't compromise the word of God. Again, you are the problem. You have to get used to that if you're not going to stay safe. So the world, our culture, young people, the more you stand for Christ and his word, the more people are going to be in rage and fury about you. And it's simply satanic rage coming through them. That's what Revelation 12, 17 teaches. So let's continue in the text. Verse 13 again. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you don't worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? That's interrogation. 
The king is basically giving these guys one more chance. I'm gonna strike up the diversity band again and I'll pretend the first time didn't happen. Just bow down this time when the music starts and all will be well. And what are their friends probably saying? They're probably saying, brothers, be safe, be safe. And that would be tempting to any of us. Tempting. I can hear Satan now tempting our master in Matthew 4, 9, saying, all these things I will give you if you what? Fall down and worship me. See those same words in our text in verse 15. If you're ready now, fall down and worship And we're subject to the same temptation today and it's getting more and more intense every day and the temptation is to stay safe. But by God's grace, we must remain determined, determined to be faithful to the Lord, faithful in the face of insinuation, faithful in the face of interrogation, and number three, faithful in the face even of intimidation. Remember the last line there, verse 15. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? That's nothing more than intimidation. He's just saying, do you know who you're dealing with here? Now, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered. Notice, please, they answer as one here. They're of one accord in this. You are a very, very blessed person indeed. If the Lord has put or ever does put two two other people in your life who will stand faithfully with you like this and answer with you in one accord. Verse 16, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Look at what the guys do here, church by God's grace, because what they do here is worth imitating. They confess, concede, and commit. They confess, our God is able to deliver us from you. They concede, he may or may not, depending upon his will and wisdom, and they commit. Either way, we're not going to worship your God. Stay safe, guys. To confess, Concede and commit like this is not staying safe. Rather, it's number one, it's consecration, not contemplation. Consecration, not contemplation. In verse 15, King Nebuchadnezzar asks, and who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And of course, he's not really looking for them to name a God here, but rather he's just saying, don't you know, once I decide to condemn you, what hope do you have? The implied answer being none. It's the king using his power to intimidate. And to that intimidation, the guys in verse 16 answer, that we have no need to answer you in this matter. Don't you see Jesus standing in silence before Pilate? I have no need to answer you. It's not necessary that we give you an explanation, O king. You don't rule over us to the extent that you think. We are consecrated. We are separated to the Lord. He has chosen us and we've committed by his grace, we've committed to be faithful to him. So we're not like in in deep contemplation here about whether or not to bow down to this idol, we know that's not gonna happen because we're consecrated to the one true living God. Consecration, not contemplation. Church, if we're not consecrated now, we will contemplate staying safe later. Number two, This is confidence, not conjecture. Confidence, not conjecture. Conjecture meaning speculation or guesswork. 
In verse 17, they say, if that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. That's confidence there. They're not trying to guess exactly what God's gonna do here. They really have no idea how he might deliver them if he does. They're just confident in God's ability and confident in God's character. We need to pray for the grace of being confident in the ability and character of God. And this leads to the point of the entire sermon today. Number three, courage not cowardice. Courage, not cowardice. Verse 18, let it be known to you, O king, that we don't serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. That's very courageous, brothers and sisters, because they know what kind of man they're dealing with here in Nebuchadnezzar. They've seen his instability through the years. Oh, we need a courageous Christianity today, church. The heat is turned on and will be turned up seven times hotter in the immediate years ahead of us. The trial will be fiery. We must have courage. We must not be urging one another to stay safe. All I have left to do now is to show you why I'm talking about all of this today. What does it have to do with our sermon series to the book of Acts? I'll simply show you, then close. Last week, we finished up at Acts 4.12. Please look with me for a moment at verse 13. Turn in your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13. This is the next verse we will expound in our series through the book of Acts. Acts 4.13 Recall, Peter and John are standing before the governing body of the land, the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin which is hostile toward them, the Sanhedrin which has them on trial, if you will, for healing a guy in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who they said, the Sanhedrin, you have crucified. Acts 14 excuse me, Acts 4, 13 says, now when they, that is the Sanhedrin, saw the, what? The boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. They realized they had been with Jesus when they saw their refusal to stay safe. They realized they had been with Jesus when they saw their boldness. That Greek word there can also be translated confidence, freedom, fearlessness, and courage. It cannot be translated staying safe. Next week, Lord willing, or actually next time in our series, uh, next week I won't be here and we'll have a guest preacher, but... When I come back the week after that, we'll start right here at verse 13 and begin to work to the end of this chapter, doing a bit of a study of Christian courage. The plan is to see that Christian courage is possible, perceivable, powerful, problematic, potent, priceless, prophetic, purposeful, permeating, and promising. That's where we're headed in the coming weeks, if the Lord allows. Until then, brothers and sisters, until we gather again, I say to you, go do what the Lord has given you to do, and God's grace be with you as you do it. Amen.